Hello everyone. If you like what I'm doing here, please consider subscribing, liking, and commenting. It would really help the channel out quite a bit. Thank you very much. Tokyo 78, WBBM, Chicago. The Mystery Theater is next. The CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... My father, who had a great deal of wisdom, used to say that the friendship of the over-friendly man is too often like a fire in the grate, exceedingly bright to look at, but not reliable, should you wish to keep warm on a really cold day. The tale we're about to unfold for you, written by the incomparable Edgar Allan Poe, is not about a friendship that cooled off, but rather about one that became too hot to handle. Well, what do you and Noah talking about, Edgar? The disappearance of Horace Kramer, Charlie. Yes, it is puzzling. I can't for the life of me understand what's keeping Horace this long in Boston. Do you think he's still there? Edgar thinks he never got there. What makes you say that, Noah? Edgar suspects foul play. And so do I. <laughs> mystery drama, The Case of the Chateau Margot, was adapted from a story by Edgar Allan Poe, especially for Mystery Theater by James Agate Jr., and stars Jackson Beck and Robert Dryden. It is sponsored in part by Buick Motor Division and Contact, the 12-hour cold capsule. I'll be back shortly with Act One. ever thought what a lonely old world this would be? Were there no one you could call a friend? A good friend? Someone who thinks as you do? Likes what you like? And even more than that, likes to spend time with you? With whom you could share any confidence, any time? So I suppose it's no wonder that in the small, isolated New England town of Mystic Falls, rich old Horace Kramer was delighted when a man his own age moved next door and became Horace's friend. The time is 1910. But let someone who actually lived through those curious and perplexing days tell us what happened. My name is Ed Edgar. My full name is... Yeah, Edgar, Edgar. I grew up with that awful handicap, but... Finally, after years of kidding here in my hometown, Mystic Falls, Massachusetts, now everyone has settled for Edgar, Ed, or Mr. Edgar. I write, print, and publish the Mystic Gazette, our local town newspaper. And we've never missed a weekly appearance since my father started the Gazette 75 years ago. One day, I had a visit from Noah Greeley, the town magistrate. Have you heard the latest, Edgar? About what, Noah? Horace Kramer has disappeared. Couldn't be. I saw him the day before yesterday. Well, oh, so did everyone else in Mystic Falls, but I haven't seen hide and a hair of him all day, yesterday or today. Noah, if you think it news that the richest man in town has gone off somewhere by himself and told nobody where he was going, I can't print that. Oh. Hold your horses, Ed. It looks like foul play. Oh, please, now. You know old Horace doesn't have an enemy in the world. He doesn't have a friend in the world, which is far worse. Well, you're forgetting, Charlie Nash. I can't talk to you while that press is operating. I'll come back later. No, no, no. Stay, stay. I'll stop this run. Tell me what you know. All right. Day before yesterday, very early in the morning, Horace saddled up. Told his servants he was going to Boston for the day and that he'd be back that night. That's 15 miles. 30, there and back. No one I've talked to since has laid eyes on him. Have you just been sitting on this and doing nothing? <laughs> what could I do? I only just got the news myself. Noah Greeley, 
You're the magistrate. I checked Horace's servants, of course, uh, just this morning. I asked, why didn't you tell somebody your master disappeared? What did they say? They told Charlie, they said. He told them, oh, it'll be all right. Let's wait and see who wants to alarm everybody. Uh, maybe you're right. Something could have happened to him. I wonder why Charlie said... Oh, yeah, speak of the devil. Good morning, good morning, good morning. How fortunate to find two of Mystic Falls' most prominent citizens together. Good morning, Charlie. What are you two gentlemen cooking up? The disappearance of Horace Kramer. Yes, it is puzzling. I cannot, for the life of me, understand what is keeping Horace this long in Boston. Oh, you think he's still there? Edgar and I think he never got there. Whatever makes you say that? Uh, it's possible he met with foul play. I think you're both alarmists. Horace can take care of himself. He wouldn't put up with any nonsense from any highwayman. For one thing, he's too good a shot. Unless he was ambushed. Not only that, gentlemen. I happen to know he was well armed when he set out for Boston. He was carrying quite a bit of money with him to deposit. No, if you ask me... I'd say Horace is probably staying on in Boston. And any one of these days, he'll be waltzing back into town, wondering what all the fuss was about. I first met Charlie Nash six months ago. He pulled into town, not knowing a soul. In two weeks, he was on buddy-buddy terms with rich, retired Horace Kramer. Charlie never let a day pass but that he wasn't over at Horace's house. Sometimes for breakfast, always for dinner. No question, Charlie was good company, and the last time I had knocked on Horace's door, the two old codgers were carrying on like kids. Uh, I hope I'm not intruding, Mr. Kramer. Charlie, are you fellas celebrating something? Shall, shall we tell him? Why not? Maybe news for the Gazette. <laughs> Oh, come on now, Charlie. Do you think our little jollification is worth a headline? I'd rather be a headline than a footnote any day, wouldn't you? <laughs> Edgar, we're just having a good time. Uh, now, what is it, Edgar? What brings you here? Well, I understand your nephew, Philip, will be arriving soon, and... <laughs> it was six months since this man, Charlie, and I met... And it's a six-month anniversary we're celebrating with some good wine. I'd say some excellent wine. Hey, have a glass, Edgar. Chateau Margot. No, thanks, Horace. I never drink while I'm working. Well, that's the difference between us. I never work while I'm drinking. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> well, even if you didn't, my boy, you can never be able to catch up with Charlie here. He downs this Chateau Margot like water. Does my heart good. Yeah, Mr. Kramer. You yeah, know, don't call me Horace, Eddie Edgar. You always have. No, I won't stay but a moment. I just want to verify. You're more of a party pooper than your father was, Eddie, my boy. Come on now, have some wine. No, 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 thanks, really. You know, Charlie, I knew this boy's father very well. Wilbur Edgar. He was a great parlor magician. Ventriloquist. Oh, yes. Wilbur Edgar was... Quite a practical joker. I mean, who else with the last name of Edgar would have given his son the identical first name? Edgar, Edgar. Well, the boy's father used imagination, and I approve of imagination. Uh, shall we remove the offending cork from another bottle? Uh, <laughs> uh, Edgar, let me tell you, when a man gets to be my age, all his old friends have either taken to their beds or died off. That pretty well leaves an older man friendless. Yeah, but I was fortunate. Along comes Charlie Nash here, drifting into town. Correction, I never drift. Yeah, moves in right next door. And I'll say his friendship has given me a brand new lease on life. Horace, I can say in all sincerity, you have done the same for me. Congratulations to the both of you. Uh, Charlie, you are by odds the hardiest old fella I have come across in all my born days. And since you love to savor the wine in that fashion, I'll be darned if I don't have to make you a present of a great big box of that very same Chateau Margot. Now, don't say a word. 
It'll be coming your way one of these days when you least expect it. Horace. Horace, what can I say but thank you? What I did come to ask you, Horace, was about your nephew. I just got word over at Sam's General Store that your nephew is arriving from Boston. He's going to be staying with you. It'd uh, make a nice piece in our social column. Hmm. You mean Philip? Uh, I don't want to talk about him. He's a no-good, high-living son of my dear departed sister. And he's staying with me because he has no place else to go. Uh, Horace, can you tell me a little about him? What he does? How old? And so on? I said I don't wish to talk about him. I don't approve of him or his way of life. And I don't particularly want him here. And that was the last time I saw Horace Kramer. His nephew, Philip, arrived in Mystic Falls the following day. He seemed quiet enough. By talking with him or playing an occasional game of checkers over at Sam's General Store, I couldn't determine whether he was of bad character or dissipated habits. One day, Charlie Nash came in while Philip and I were playing. Edgar, I'd move the red in the back row one square over to block his double jump. Uh, Charlie, will you please go away? Philip and I are having a dandy game without your help. Well, I just don't want to see you taken advantage of. Advantage? What are you talking about? We're playing on a board with everything in sight. Now, just, just go and sit down, Mr. Nash, and leave us be. Now, Master Philip, is that a way to talk to your elders? Well, you may be somebody's elder, but not mine. Mr. Nash, I've seen your type before. And frankly, the way you're sponging off my uncle is disgusting. Well, coming from a young man of your reputation, I consider that a compliment. Uh, <laughs> l let's forget the game, Philip. Huh? I've had enough of this. Oh, Edgar. Edgar, I've been looking for you everywhere. Have you heard the latest? Not yet, Noah, but I will. Go on. Horace's horse just wandered into town with no saddle and no saddlebags. Without Horace? His horse. You sure? Well, come on. See for yourself. Poor animal showed up behind Horace's house in terrible shape. Bleeding. It's been shot in the chest, it looks like. It's a wonder it can still walk. No sign of my uncle? No. And as I said, everything's been taken from the animal's back. I know Uncle Horace was carrying two saddlebags when he left for Boston. I know that. Excuse me. I don't think... No, no, I just can't stand here like this. I have to see that horse. Now, maybe there's a hopeful explanation to it all. Hopeful explanation, you stupid tub of lard. Hopeful. Obviously, my uncle has been robbed and probably killed, and you talk about hopeful? Now, young man, I can understand your distress. It's no greater than my own, I assure you. And we can do without the funny names, too. Now, gentlemen, first things first. Let's go see this horse. My point is the wound on the horse could have been an accident. A hunter somewhere out there could have missed his target, hit Horace's horse, and it bolted. But that hardly explains Horace's disappearance. I haven't finished. The horse bolts, runs through the underbrush, saddlebags are torn off. My dearest old friend is thrown off. So where is he now, three days later? You all know how stubborn he is. If he got thrown from his horse, probably made him so darn mad, he took his saddlebag. I thought you said they were torn off. If they weren't torn off, took them, picked up some other means of transportation, went on to Boston. So I say, let's calm down, everybody. I refuse to calm down. Mr. Greeley, you are the magistrate of Mystic Falls, aren't you? Yes, I am. I charge you to make an immediate search of this entire area. I want you to organize a hunt for the body of my murdered uncle. Murdered? A singular expression, young man. Noah, Edgar, Sam, you're all witnesses to this extraordinary remark of Philip Kramer. What private knowledge does he have to assert that his uncle has been murdered? Could it be because... He had something to gain from the death of a rich uncle. You take that back. I am merely offering a You theory. lying, fat, conniving... Oh, 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 no, 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 Philip, Philip, stop it, stop that. No, no, it's him. You killed him, Let go, let go of me. Stop him. Uh, look at him lying there, covering his face with his hands. Now, you stop that. He's an old man. Oh, all right. I hope that's... Taught the lying old schemer a lesson. Uh, can I give you a hand, Charlie? Yes. Now, you... You all saw that unprovoked attack. Young man, I shan't forget this. 
I shall not forget this as long as I live. What have we here? A young man, not liked by his wealthy uncle, suddenly appears in town. Shortly thereafter, the uncle disappears. What else do we know? That the uncle may have been robbed or murdered? Certainly Charlie, who claims to be the uncle's best friend, is suspicious of the young nephew. Does he know more than he is saying? Well, we shall know either more or less of this Edgar Allan Poe story when I return shortly with Act Two. Who was it who said, Murder, though it have no tongue, will speak with most miraculous organ? Before today's mystery is solved... We shall give you the answer, and you'll be no little surprised how much this saying applies to our tale by Edgar Allan Poe. But to return to where we are, Noah Greeley, the town magistrate, organized practically everyone to search for the missing Horace Kramer. But at the town hall meeting, not everyone agreed how to go about it. Order! Order! We, uh, we're trying to conduct this town hall meeting in the proper way. Mr. Chairman, no. May I have the floor? Uh, go ahead, Charlie. I think we're all making darn fools of ourselves. One of these days, old Horace will show up in his own time and at his own pleasure. Talk, talk, talk. Who's going to take action? That's what I'd like to know. All of you make me sick. My uncle is lying out there somewhere. Philip. Time passes. You all talk. Philip Kramer, you are out of order. Well, I don't care if I am. We have to act and act fast. My uncle is out there somewhere. Who knows if he's still alive? Maybe sick, injured, needing help. I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going out this very minute and look for him. I was crazy not to have done it before. Goodbye. Well, I'm sorry about that young man. As to those of you who haven't met him, that was Horace's nephew, Philip. A bit headstrong. Noah, I wonder if you could get some reaction, pro or con, for or against searching bodies. Well, uh, what do you say, Edgar? It was your proposal. Well, could we have a show of hands? All those who feel well qualified to lead a search party in, let us say, a five-mile radius... Will they raise their hands? No one? Oh, oh, yes, I see one hand. Oh, 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 it's your hand, Charlie. Well, as you know, folks, I'm retired. So I've had plenty of time in the six months I've lived in Mystic Falls to explore. And I would say I've covered every inch round here. So I have had that advantage over most of you who are... Farming, uh, horseshoeing, or minding stores. Well, I propose that as many as would care to join us at the village green at two o'clock so that we can set forth under Charlie Nash's guidance. Charlie turned out an excellent guide. The bunch of us, at least 20, followed him through all kinds of -of out-of-the-way paths, finding places none of us knew existed. The first day, we searched till it got dark, about six. But then for almost a week, from morning till night. Not a trace of Horace Kramer. Until the day Charlie led us to a pond four miles from Mystic Falls. Has anybody seen Philip Kramer? Philip? Hey, is Philip back there? I'm here. Edgar, I'd like to show you something. Look down there at those horseshoe tracks. See that little depression on the heel of each shoe? I... Yes, I do. That's Uncle Horace's horse. And look here. Where the brambles are broken off. It's as if something heavier than a man was dragged through here. Oh, you're right. So it does. I'd look in that pond. Heavier than a man, eh? I suggest we have this pond drained. There are enough of us with spades we could... I'll dig some runoffs. We'll fall, too. Excellent idea. Oh, 
How's the digging going, Edgar? Well, they got three trenches dug, and the pond's running off pretty quickly. Isn't that something lying down there on the bottom? Yeah. Sure, I can see the back of something. Oh, you're right, Charlie. There is something. What is it? Well, look, look. Down, down there. Uh, let me see if I can fish it out with my shovel. Yeah. You got it. Now, what is it? Black silk waistcoat, if I'm not mistaken. Ah, so it is. Or was. Fairly ruined now. Torn. Where have I seen this waistcoat before? Those dark stains around the collar and the front could be blood. Philip, you ever seen this waistcoat before? I, uh, I think it's mine. Yours? Yes, I think it is. Looks like it. Philip Kramer... You realize this is very serious. You admit this blood-stained waistcoat is yours? Oh, I didn't say that. It's very like one of mine. Surely, Noah, you're not actually making an accusation because this bloody, torn waistcoat, which may belong to Horace's nephew, was discovered here. Now, hold on there. We don't know that is blood. Precisely. We don't know it's blood. Or, if it is... Then it's Horace Kramer's blood, or Phillips. Then, too, one must think in terms of a motive. Just because this young rapscallion happens to be Horace Kramer's sole heir and would inherit everything, does that mean he is a suspect? Well, it uh, doesn't rule him out, Charlie. Just a moment. We don't know, first of all, whether Horace is dead. We found no body. Secondly, as far as inheritance is concerned, I remember a year ago Horace telling me he was planning to disinherit him. All we have to do is locate a will. And if indeed Philip is cut off without a penny, what does that do to your motive, huh? Well, I've never heard such nonsense in all my life. I'm not giving up hope that Uncle Horace isn't still alive. But frankly, this search led by this... Fat fool is too comic for me. For a week now, we've been traipsing through brush and bramble, and all we've got to show for it is a muddy waistcoat and no sign of my uncle. Well, I'm heading back to Mystic Falls. I've had enough. Uh, Philip, until I give you the word, I charge you not to leave Mystic Falls. Charlie! Charlie! Where are you going? Just thought I saw something lying in the road up ahead. Ah, man. Well, what is it? What are you putting in your pocket? It's a Spanish knife. Yes. There appears to be blood on the open blade. Now that I look at it more closely. Now, does anybody know to whom this knife belongs? Oh, my goodness. Charlie, you know to whom it belongs? Uh, Yeah, yes, I I, I might. But uh, I am not the one to identify it. Is Philip still here? Yes, of course I'm still here. What is it? Is uh, this knife, this Spanish knife yours? I... I... Philip, is this knife yours? I'm afraid there are initials on it, too. Oh, yeah, so there are. P.C. Philip Kramer. Are those your initials? Y- yes. So this is your knife? Yes, it is. Philip, can you explain why your knife is lying out here on the road? No, no, I can't. Philip Kramer, I arrest you on suspicion of the murder of your uncle, Horace Kramer. Now, the purpose of this interrogation is to clear up certain allegations in view of certain evidence. Uh, I understand that you, Philip Kramer do have something to add with regard to the identification of the waistcoat found at the bottom of the pond. It is mine. It must be mine. I've examined it more closely, and I noticed one button is missing at the bottom, which is proof to me that it is my waistcoat. Ah, so noted. Would you like to tell us, Philip, where you were the morning your Uncle Horace left for Boston? Glad to. I was out with my rifle deer-stalking. Were you anywhere in the vicinity of the pond in which your waistcoat was found? I'd like to correct a misapprehension. Uh 
I said that waistcoat was mine. Not that I was wearing it. Ah. Uh. Oh, yes. Yes, I was in that vicinity because I clearly remember noticing the tracks made by my uncle's horse. The same ones I showed you. Do you uh, realize, Mr. Kramer, what you are telling us? The waistcoat is yours. A knife that was found nearby is also yours. You were in that vicinity, and moreover, you now admit to carrying a rifle for the purpose of deer stalking. So? Yes, that's so. May I ask the indulgence of the magistrate for a moment? Uh, yes, Charlie, by all means. I, uh, I had not wished to further complicate matters by divulging the information I have. But now I do feel it my duty to bring it to your attention. Let me tell you what I know. The evening before Horace left for Boston, he and I were playing a game of checkers. And his nephew, Philip, appeared. Jump, 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 jump! Ha! <laughs> what do you think of that, Charlie? <laughs> nice going, Horace. Caught me completely by surprise. Oh, <laughs> it did, didn't it? Yep, I can say it in two words. Completely. <laughs> Ah, Philip. Well, to what do we have the pleasure of your company this evening? It's the shank, the very shank of the evening. I'd expect you to be out dancing, carousing, gambling, or whatever it is you're so noted for. What are you doing home? You don't think much of me, Uncle, do you? Well, I never asked more of you than a place to sleep. Believe me, I don't enjoy being dependent on your favors. Well, just in case you're harboring the hope that because you are my only living relative, Philip, let me, uh, let me assure you, I am planning to revise my will, and your name will not be mentioned in it. I'm sorry to hear that, Uncle. I, I bet you are. Yeah, I've threatened such action before, but now, knowing you better, tomorrow I shall actually take steps. Yes. Tomorrow morning, I'm off to Boston with two tasks. One, to make a cash deposit at the Farmers and Mechanics Bank. And two, to sign my new will. Now, if you'll be so good, kindly leave Charlie and me alone. So that we can continue our check again. Philip Kramer, you just heard Charlie Nash here recount an event that happened the night before your uncle set off for Boston. Uh, is this the truth or not? Is what the truth? Did you know your uncle was going to Boston in the morning to deposit money? Did he tell you he was about to change his will to disinherit you? Yes. Would you repeat your answer clearly, please? Yes, Uncle Horace did say that. But I still say I know nothing of his disappearance, and I did not kill him. <laughs> sorry we must leave this tale of suspicion and mystery at this very moment. Does it strike you as strange that Philip Kramer, the only person suspected of having had a hand in his uncle's disappearance, seems so very self-assured? Is he feigning innocence? Hiding guilt? Or is someone else the actual guilty party? We'll be back with some of the answers shortly. Edgar Allan Poe taken us thus far. A rich man has disappeared. Evidence has been uncovered pointing in only one direction to a wasteful nephew now suspected of murder. But knowing Edgar Allan Poe, I would caution you not to believe there is an easy, straightforward answer to the question of what happened to Horace Kramer. There will be many a twist and turn before our tale is completed. <laughs> Philip Kramer admitted he knew the purpose of his uncle's trip to Boston. Nor Greeley deputized me and the owner of the general store, Sam, to make a thorough search of Philip's room. When we returned to the town jail, Noah and Charlie were still there, as was the suspect. Well, it didn't take you two very long. It's not a large room. The broom closet is bigger. 
And we found this pocketbook empty in Phillips' room. Mm. It's Horace's. I recognized it right away. And these uh, bedclothes, the shirt, the neck handkerchief? Uh... Stuffed under Phillips' bed. Yeah. That, that, look carefully. Mm. That may be blood on them. Goodness. Blood. That poor man. To die like that. I cannot believe it. Blood. Well, I think we have a fairly open and shut case here, don't you? Well, I'm not defending Philip, but I do say a man is innocent till proved guilty. All this dreadful, dreadful evidence. I mean, Noah, I, you have no corpus delecti, no body. Well, I may not have Horace's body yet, but I do have his horses. What do you mean? Well, while you and Sam were out, I got word Horace's horse died in the stable. From the wound he'd got. I think a post-mortem of that horse should be made immediately. You know, if it weren't for the fact that my uncle is missing, but there is some mystery there, I would say the lot of you are behaving like a comic opera, like a stupid bunch of incompetent bumpkins. Such a statement does not endear yourself to those who live here. Look at the facts. My waistcoat is found. Supposedly blood on it. Anyone could have put it there, smeared it with anything, ketchup. Then my knife turns up, also supposedly covered with my uncle's blood. Then sheets and shirts under my bed. You don't know if it's blood or red paint. Where do you suppose all this mysterious evidence came from, dear boy? I haven't the faintest idea. And if it were true that I did away with Uncle Horace, why would I leave evidence lying around or under my own bed? Perhaps you thought the bumpkins in Mystic Falls would never find it. Oh, a very poor joke and very poor taste, if you ask me. I'd say it's a good thing we don't ask you. Mr. Nash, I've had a feeling about you all along. I've been wondering if you really are all that concerned about Uncle Horace, or if your so-called helpfulness is an act. Are you gentlemen going to stand here and see me maligned by a man accused of murder, Sam Noah? Hold on, Charlie. Philip is being held in custody on suspicion of murder. Nothing more. There's a lot of evidence, admittedly, still unproven. Oh, go do your post-mortem on a dead horse. It might interest you to know, my young city-bred friend, that should I discover the actual bullet that killed Horace's horse, it could inevitably lead us to the gun. First the bullet, and then, sure, shall I weapon. Oh, I see. Now, this renowned checker player wine drinker is also a horse doctor. Oh, no, no. We'll have Dr. Corwin, the town veterinarian, actually perform the autopsy. Events moved swiftly. Charlie Nash found a bullet in the horse's chest cavity, which had somehow escaped Dr. Corwin's eye. Philip identified the bullet... Recognizing it as one of a special set he had made for his hunting rifle. At the very next criminal session, Philip was brought to trial. He still treated the matter lightly, not even seeking legal advice. The town appointed a lawyer to defend him. But confronted with this unbreakable chain of circumstantial evidence, the jury returned an immediate verdict of guilty of murder in the first degree. Edgar, Edgar, I have news for you. Look at this letter, my fine friend. It's what I came to show you. Go ahead, read it. Huh? Oh, uh, 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 Charles Nash, Esquire. Dear sir, in conformity with an order transmitted to our firm two months ago by Mr. Horace Kramer... We have the honor of forwarding this morning to your address a double case of Chateau Margot, half a gross, six dozen bottles, antelope brand. We remain, sir, your most obedient servants, and, uh, and so forth. Well, that is news. Read what it says on the bottom. Uh, the box will reach you by wagon the Monday following the receipt of this letter. Yours, Mill Bracken and Company. Isn't that like dear, sweet, thoughtful old Horace? You know, we used to drink Shadow Margot together by the quart. It was the seal of our friendship, as it were. 
He did once say he was going to send me a case or so. I forgot all about it. I seem to remember that. What I would like you to do, Edgar, is to put in the weekend edition of the Gazette. The news that I am extending an invitation, uh, let us call it a, a kind of open house, to all who would like to call themselves my friends. And when the case of Chateau Margot arrives from the Millbracken people, then we'll open the pièce de résistance. <laughs> Pretty close to half the town was at Charlie's on Monday. There was lots of food and drink. The case of wine didn't arrive till early evening. By that time, everyone was in a very happy mood. Uh, that is the biggest wooden crate I've ever seen. Lifted right up onto the table facing me. <laughs> All right, everybody. Let's open up the case and see how far 72 bottles of Chateau Margot will go. <laughs> I can recommend it to you all. Come on, come on, somebody. Get a crowbar. Well, wait a minute. I brought a big hammer, Charlie. I can pry the box open. Good thinking for the state. Always prepared to be printworthy. <laughs> open it from the end that faces me, Edgar. Now, a respectful silence as Mr. Edgar disinters the treasure. <laughs> Charlie happy to give orders to be the center of all attention. This moment was his dream come true. Charlie surrounded by friends and neighbors, all waiting for what Charlie would give them. Suddenly, the top of the huge box flew open. And from inside, there sprang up into a sitting position, facing Charlie, the booze bloody, nearly putrid corpse of old dead Horace Kramer. He seemed to look right at Charlie with his sightless eyes. Then, suddenly, slowly, the corpse spoke. Charlie, old friend, how could you do this to me? <laughs> Having said that, the decaying corpse of Horace Kramer fell over the side of the crate, his arms sort of reaching for Charlie. Men fainted. Some ran for the doors, but slowly, as if magnetized, everyone came back to watch Charlie. How did you get back, Horace? I know you were dead. Were you watching me all the time? Did you see me following you down the road when you got near the pool? Were you alive or dead? I left you for dead. I had bad luck with your horse. I shot him. He wouldn't die. Would you believe it, Horace? I pushed him clean into the pool to drown. And the next day, he walked right back into town wasn't easy to cover my tracks. I had to plant all kinds of evidence so my friends would think it was your nephew. Horace, it wasn't easy at all. Horace, as you just said, I say, how could you do this to me? Oh, my heart. Charlie. He's fallen on the table. Charlie! My lord. Charlie is dead. He's dead as Horace. Philip, you're free. The body of your uncle was delivered to Charlie's house in a crate of wine. And he, your uncle, accused Charlie of killing him. What, what, in what way? Do it not so fast. Anyway, Charlie confessed. Uh... I'm afraid I had a hand in this. Oh, I thought you might have, Edgar. You were the only one who never believed the evidence. I wasn't that positive Philip wasn't guilty, but I was pretty sure Charlie wasn't that innocent. From the beginning? Well, he was too helpful. That made me suspicious. And didn't you think it was strange, Noah, that it was always Charlie who discovered things? Where was I, with my eyes closed? First of all, Philip was an outsider. 
Secondly, almost everyone in town liked Charlie, so why should you suspect him? Well, for me, he went just one step too far. What did he do? The autopsy of Horace's horse. Even with Dr. Corwin right there, it was Charlie who found the bullet. But he palmed that bullet. That bullet never went near the horse. There was a bullet hole where a shot had gone in, but another where it had gone out. No. It couldn't have been Philip's gun that killed the animal. Well, why didn't you tell me? We could have held up the trial. No, I, I couldn't stop you. Besides, I had to find the body. Now, you remember how it was Charlie who led the search party? So I searched myself. And wherever he had gone, I went in the opposite direction. Well, eventually, I found an old dry well. Very well concealed. And Horace was down there, at the bottom. Neck broken. Terrible sight. I wrote that letter from the wine merchants and put him in the crate. Ingenious. We're horrible. Well, how in the world did you get Horace to speak? That's a talent I've had since I was a boy. My father taught me voice throwing, ventriloquism. Charlie, old friend, how could you do this to me? So ends one of the great horror stories from the prolific pen of that master of the macabre, Edgar Allan Poe. I think it is almost as though Poe took and dramatized that one famous sentence of William Shakespeare's, Murder, though it have no tongue, will speak with most miraculous organ. I'll be back shortly. that Edgar Allan Poe is the founder of the modern detective story. But I think he goes far beyond that, bringing together the strangely imaginative and the grotesque. A torn waistcoat, a bloody knife, a bullet. On these few objects, Poe hangs an entire plot of villainy and bizarre retribution. Man has always been fascinated by objects. Writing about their criminal use is called detective work. Studying and analyzing objects is called science. But one doesn't have to be a scientist or a Ph.D. to enjoy a good mystery. Our cast included Robert Dryden, Jackson Beck, William Griffiths, and Lloyd Batista. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. And now, a preview of our next tale. We had the compartment to ourselves and a batch of newspapers Holmes had brought along with him. As we settled down for the journey, Holmes asked... Have you heard anything about the case? Well, I, I, I haven't seen a paper for some days. Uh, it's just as well. The London press hasn't had very complete accounts, and that's why I brought these, these local papers along. I've already read through them, and I gather it's one of those simple cases which are so extremely difficult. Well, well isn't that paradoxical? Of course, and profoundly true. Singularity is almost invariably a clue. The more commonplace a crime, the more difficult it is to bring home. In this instance, however, the police seem to have established a very serious case against the son of the murdered man. Well, it is a murder then, huh? According to our old friend Lestrade, it's not only murder, but he has the guilty man under lock and key. Oh. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by True Value Hardware Stores. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. you.
news. Congress continues to argue the issue of federal funding for abortions, holding up approval of an important money bill. This is Doug Poling reporting on the CBS radio network. The abortion writer is attached to a $60 billion appropriation for the Departments of Labor and HEW. Thousands of federal workers might not get paid, and a number of programs to aid the poor 